Chapter 7 For over three hours, they were dragged through stinking marshes and haunted forests by the loping parade of filthy cannibalistic peasants. Their captives were not the feral brood's only spoils either. They had hastily ransacked the larder of Moore's Rest, filling sacks with cheese and bread, meat and wineskins. Corpses had been hastily dismembered, and several of the sacks were now soaked in blood, stuffed with human body parts. They kept off the roads, hauled along paths overgrown with thorn bushes and rushes. Occasionally they were forced into the open, scurrying across muddy fields filled with rotting crops, watched over by the silhouettes of scarecrows. Sometimes they could see lights in the distance, but their captors seemed keen to avoid areas of habitation and veered away from them. They trudged knee-deep into vast tracts of swampland, beset by great clouds of stinging midges. They climbed from the stinking morass as the ground rose, and their pace picked up again as they ran through an abandoned village that had been left to rot. The peasants seemed to be more at ease here, speaking among themselves in their low, ugly tongue. Callard was poked and prodded by the peasants, whose eyes were gleaming with hunger. Feet slapped loudly on the roadway, which rose steadily, winding its way through the dead village. Soon they were in the countryside again, leaving the decrepit houses behind them. They climbed ever upwards, the muddy roadway clinging up to the steep sides of a hill. A crumbling, six-foot wall ran alongside the high side of the road. They turned through a decaying stone gateway overrun with thorn bushes and ivy. An ancient gate hung on rusty hinges, and the procession of peasants passed through. Kellard noted the hourglass carved atop the archway as he was bustled through beneath it. A garden of more, he said under his breath. They rose above the cloying blanket of ever-present fog, and Callard was afforded a clearer view of the surroundings. The graveyard reared up before them, clinging to a hilltop riddled with mausoleums and tombs. It was massive and sprawling, a veritable city of the dead. Tens of thousands were likely buried here. The graves lowest on the hill were packed in tight and marked with cracked headstones and slabs worn smooth by the passage of time. Many had clearly been desecrated and dug up. Winged skeletal statues being slowly strangled by ivy stood over some, while in other areas mass graves were commemorated with little more than crude epitaphs scratched into stone slabs. Large family mausoleums protruded from the hillside as they climbed higher the richer tombs carved deep into the rock cliffs. Black roses grew in abundance, their petals soft and velveteen, their deadly thorns curved and shining silver. They exuded a heady, sickly sweet aroma. Ravens were perching in the leafless, twisted trees clinging to the hillside, watching the procession. Images of death were everywhere, from carved hourglasses and black roses on tombs and opulent facades to extravagant sculptures depicting the god of the underworld, Moore, in his various guises. The peasants became more animated, cavorting and leaping, grinning and guffowing. More of the depraved creatures joined the group, though Callard had no idea where they came from. Within the tombs themselves, maybe. Feeling eyes upon him, he looked up to see a child clinging to the base of a cracked, moss-covered statue. The child... He couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl, was clearly starving, little more than a skeleton encased in skin, its head too big for its frail body. It stared at him with red-rimmed eyes, and its flesh was covered in open sores. Something about the child's intense gaze made his skin crawl. It hissed at him, bearing small pointed teeth. Kellard grimaced as his captors yanked at a noose around his neck, jerking him onward. Ever higher they climbed, and then down into the yawning mouth of one of the larger crypts. They passed under a lintel carved in the likeness of Moore, arms outspread as if in welcome. It was cold and dank in the low-ceilinged burial chamber, and it smelled of wet earth and things long ago dead. Roots hung from a rough-hewn roof like grasping skeletal hands. A massive, sculptured sarcophagus dominated the tomb. The heavy lid, 
carved to represent a serenely posed knight with arms crossed over his chest, lay cracked and discarded on the floor. What is this? said Kellard through clenched teeth, as he was dragged towards the casket. Get in! hissed one of the peasants. He strained against his captors, fighting against them as they tried to haul him towards the open casket. Had they dragged him all this way just to bury him alive? He was far bigger than any of them, and they struggled to make him move, but his face began to turn purple as the noose around his neck tightened. Enough! hissed one of them, breaking the deadlock by kicking Callard hard in the small of his back. He staggered forwards, pushed up against the casket, and looked down into it, gasping for breath. Bones and rotting cloth had been pushed roughly aside within the open casket, and he saw that a hole had been smashed in the bottom of the sarcophagus. He could feel a slight breeze coming up through the hole, bringing with it a fetid stench of decay. One of the peasants crawled in like a spider and disappeared down the hole. Bring them! came a voice from the darkness. Oh, lady, protect your servant, breathed Callard. The entire hill was riddled with tunnels, and they were dragged deep into the labyrinth. Chewed bones were strewn across the floor of the tunnels, and the way was lit by stinking candles burning in carved niches. Faces crowded around to look upon the newcomers, from tiny children to ancient crones, and Callard realized that there must have been many hundreds of peasants eking out a horrid existence down here beneath the earth. What better place for them to call home than a graveyard, he thought darkly. All of these inhabitants were starving, their eyes were dull and lifeless, as if any hope that ever dwelt there had long ago faded. Tiny, shrunken babes, too weak to cry, were held to the bony chests of mothers, unable to produce milk to feed them. Most of the peasants were stooped and hunched, their bodies and faces malnourished and ugly from generations of inbreeding and malnutrition. Many of them were missing limbs, and more than a few bore evidence of leprosy and other wasting sicknesses. They were a pitiful bunch, and even Callard, who was usually inured to the fate of those of low birth, found himself disturbed. Hands covered in dirt reached at him as he was dragged deeper beneath the ground touching his face and clothes in wonder. The procession gathered a sizable entourage, as Callard, Rayburn, and Claude were led into the depths beneath the Garden of Moor. Every side passage was filled with staring faces. Children ran behind them. As they descended further, the catacombs carved by the hands of men gave way to naturally formed caves, their walls slick with moisture. At last they came to a rocky cavern at the heart of the hill. Hundreds of stubby candles lit the area with a flickering orange glow. It was cold and moist, and an acrid sting hung in the air. Looking up, Kalar could see that the roof was a seething mass of furred shapes, in the form of bats. Rock formations jutted up from the floor and hung from the ceiling. In places these had come together, forming slick-sided columns. Drips fell from the ceiling like rain, causing ripples in the milky pools of water that gathered in hollows. Dozens of natural windows to other caverns, passages and nooks looked down into the chamber, each crowded with the graveyard's inhabitants, who bustled for the best vantages. Callard and Raven were dragged towards a natural stone platform in the center of the cavern. An empty throne was carved into the rock at the center of the platform. Hundreds of human skulls were piled up around it. Seated on the roughly hewn steps below the throne was a figure that Callard at first mistook to be a dusty corpse. Almost imperceptibly, the skeletal figure raised its head to regard their approach. Thick matted clumps of grey hair hung down over an overly long ashen face. The face was ancient. So deep were the lines that they looked as though they had been carved with a chisel. Cloudy eyes glinted in deep sockets. Callard and Raven were forced to their knees. Their weapons were tossed to the floor nearby, and the clatter they made reverberated sharply off the cavern walls. Claude tried to hang back, head low, but he was shoved forwards to stand alongside his master. What have you been keeping from me, you little toad? 
said Callard out of the corner of his mouth. It was the first chance that he had to speak to Claude since their capture. The hunchback manservant made no answer. Quiet, said a voice, and Callard was cuffed across the side of the head. How is it that you are known here? hissed Callard. Answer me! Still, Claude offered no explanation, and again Callard was struck, even harder this time, knocking him to the ground. A bone shard, as sharp as a dagger and three inches long, lay on the cavern floor just inches from his nose. He turned onto the side, wriggling, and as he was hauled back to his knees, he picked up the bone shard and secreted it in his clasped hands. A hush descended over the cavern, broken only by the steady dripping of water. The figure on the steps regarded them in silence, gaze inscrutable. I demand to be released, said Callard. The grey man's eyes bored into Callard, but he remained silent. My purpose in this land is not with you, or your people, said Callard. Release me! The ashen-faced figure continued to regard him silently for a moment, and then stood, movements slow and deliberate. His limbs were too long and too thin, like an insect's, and he seemed to unfold as he rose to his feet. His matted hair hung past his thin waist. He wore a threadbare robe of faded majesty, something that might have been worn by a noble lord in a bygone era. Delicate, moth-eaten lace hung from the cuffs of his sleeves like dusty spider webs. With regal grace he moved in front of the two kneeling knights and the quaking figure of Claude. Hands were long and slender, and his fingers were like ivory needles. He gestured for the two knights to rise, and they were hauled roughly to their feet. Callard stood with his head held high, refusing to be cowed before this pauper king and his tattered court. The grey man was frail and corpse-thin, and his back was slightly stooped, but even so he towered above Callard. He walked around the three of them, appraising them. He came to a halt in front of Claude. The hunchbacked manservant flinched as the grey man reached out towards him. Thin fingers lifted Claude's chin until he was looking up into the ancient face. Tears ran down the peasant's visage. The skeletal gone figure began to laugh. The sound was deep and hollow. It has been a long time, said the grey man, still chuckling. Welcome home, Claude. Home? hissed Callard, glancing sidewards at his servant. All color had drained out of Claude's face. Allow me to introduce myself said the wasted old man, turning towards Callard. The ghost of a smile played at his ashen lips, and the result was unsettling. He resembled nothing more than a grinning corpse. I, said the deathly old man, am Grandfather Mortis. Grandfather Mortis, said Callard dryly. The one and only said the old man, giving Callard a mocking bow. I am Callard of Garamond, a questing knight of Baston. Engaged on the quest, is it? said Mortis. And this? Raben, said the outcast knight. Just Raben? Just Raben. I see, said Mortis. He looked at Raven for a moment and then turned away. He stretched his skeletal arms theatrically wide, fingers unfurling. And these, he said, these are my children, my loving, trustworthy children. He looked pointedly at Claude, who shrank under the gaze. Your children, said Callard, are cannibalistic inbreds. In lean times, needs must, and so forth and so on, said Mortis with a shrug. To eat the flesh of your fellow man is an abomination, said Callard. 
these peasants would be better off dead. Oh, keep your moral outrage. It means nothing here, said Mortis. My children live, and that in itself is a triumph in this God's forsaken land. This is not life, said Callard, looking around him. I would sooner die than live like this. Well, that is the most interesting notion, said Mortis. There is good meat on your bones. Uh, are you going to kill us? said Claude, tears running down his face. Kill you? said Mortis, reaching out a hand to stroke Claude's face. These others, maybe, but you, of course not, child. This is where you belong. All your sins will be forgiven in time. You will be punished, of course, but you are home, and that is what matters. Turning from him, Mortis jabbed a finger at Raven. This is one of the Duke's knights, he said. Why is it not dead? This knight is under my protection, said Callard. He is not to be harmed. Is that so? said Mortis. What are you doing here in Musilon, Callard of Garamond? What brings you to this cursed realm? The lady herself has led me here. Why? What does that matter? said Callard. Just curiosity, said Mortis. Indulge an old man. I came to find someone, said Callard, and when I do, I intend to kill him. Raven smirked at that. You came to kill him? he said. You are more of a fool than I thought. He cannot be killed, not by one such as you. Any man can be killed, said Callard. Merovec is not a man, said Raben. Man, fiend, devil, I don't care, said Callard. I will kill him. Mortis lashed out, grabbing Callard by the throat. His nails bit deep into his flesh, drawing blood. Merovec, Mortis said, enunciating the name clearly so there was no misunderstanding. You came here to kill Duke Merovec? Before anyone could react, Callard's hands were free, the tough cord falling away from his wrists. No one had noticed him cutting his bindings and in the blink of an eye, he had the razor-sharp bone shard he had retrieved from the ground pressed against Mortis's neck. The cavern erupted in shouts and hisses. Hands tightened the noose around his neck, but Callard increased the pressure on the bone held to Mortis's throat. Call them off, or you die, hissed Callard. The old man made a sound like he was clearing his throat, and the peasants drew back tense and uneasy. I am no friend of Duke Merovec, Callard of Garamond, said Mortis with a deathly grin. And the enemy of one's enemy is one's friend, no? Merovec the Mad, said Mortis. The fool is obsessed with regaining Musilon's lost prestige and in doing so eradicating all he sees as vermin. Namely, my children and I. You don't mind if I sit? Callard had the sword of Garamond in his hand, the point leveled at Mortis's skeletal chest. At the command of Callard, Claude had released Raven from his bonds and retrieved their weapons. His shield and bastard sword were strapped to his back, and behind him stood Raven, blade drawn, eyeing the hostile peasants warily. Claude stood nearby, wringing his hands. Mortis lowered himself onto the stone steps below the throne with a sigh. 
At a guess, Kellar judged the old man to be maybe ninety years of age. Still, as frail as the old man appeared, Kellard was not about to underestimate him. His mind was clearly still as sharp as a razor, and he only had to speak a word and the unlooking peasants would tear them limb from limb. Five years Merovec has waged war upon us. Always in that time we have been protected by our lord, said Mortis, gesturing towards the empty throne. But he is gone now, captured three nights past on the Shadow Moors. Without him we are lost. The... the Ancient One is gone? said Claude. Mortis nodded grimly. You would be doing me a great favor if you succeeded in slaying the Duke, said Mortis skeletal fingers drumming on the stone steps. Though it is not something easily achieved. The lady is with me, said Callard grimly. The duke will die by my blade. You have my oath on it. Let's just get out of here, said Raven over the shoulder. Mortis's fingers drummed upon the dusty stone surface of the steps. Leave that one with us, he said, gesturing towards Raven, and you are free to leave. Raven flashed Callard an alarmed look. Take me with you, said Raven quickly. I can get you close to Merovec. You won't get within a hundred yards of him without me. Callard considered the decision. He's coming with me he said finally. He is one of the Duke's sworn knights, said Mortis. You think you can trust his word? Not for one moment, said Callard. He is an outcast and has no honor, but he may prove useful nevertheless. The sound of a bell tolling in the distance echoed down through the catacombs and Mortis looked up. The bats on the ceiling erupted into flight, the beat of their wings and their high-pitched cries deafening. They swirled around the cavern in a dense cloud, like a school of shoaling fish, and then hurtled through an opening in the ceiling, and they were gone. The doleful bell continued to sound. What is it? said Callard. A warning. They have come to end it, said Mortis. The peasants all around began shouting and wailing, hissing and gnashing their teeth. I don't like this, said Raven. We have to go. Merovec marches against us, said Mortis. The Warren is no longer a safe haven. He is here, said Callard, eyes lighting up. Merovec is here? He wouldn't sully his hands in person, said Mortis, shaking his head. How can you be sure, said Callard. This could end right now. He is not here, said Raven firmly. He is waiting at the palace. A victory banquet has been prepared to welcome back his captains in two nights' time. And how would you know that, said Callard. I was invited, said Raven with a sardonic smile. Enough talk, we leave now, said Mortis. We, said Callard. I will get you inside the city, said Grandfather Mortis. <laughs>